And um, so, so Joe Nick, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for coming today. It's not easy to show up at 4 p.m. in one of the fastest growing cities in the United States <laughs> that seems to be all under construction. But uh, really, thank you for making it uh, today. And so what we'll do is we'll have a conversation about Joe Nick's new book, and then we'll open it up for questions. And he'll be available to sign books at, at the end of that. Um, so well, we'll talk a little bit about the book specifically. But first, um, can you just tell us the story of how you discovered Austin, how you came to Austin? Well, every, everybody has an Austin story that lives in this area. And even if you, you're a native San Martian and you've never ventured north of the Hayes County line, Austin's kind of impacted you. But mine started kind of slow as a kid that uh, really in, in the early 60s, uh, my father had kind of gotten onto South Padre Island when the only way to get on the island was a drawbridge and there were like t two motels, a convenience store and a restaurant. It, it was pretty primitive. But we'd make these trips uh, from Fort Worth. And every time we did, it seemed like, I mean, it was more often than not, we wouldn't get to stop at Aquarina, Wonder World, or the Alamo, but we always stopped at Schultz Garden. And my father and, and stepmother wanted to stop there, and they would have a schooner of, of uh, beer, and they'd let my sister and I sip a little bit. And it was this idea of like looking under the trees and you know you see these light bulbs strung up and you hear music playing but mainly it's people talking and and more often than not they're laughing it's it's really a, a nice setting and that was kind of my first experience that was different and we, there wasn't a place like that in fort worth and coming down here through high school in particular and and then coming to parties at ut i didn't attend ut at first uh, it took, that was my fourth college uh, before I got to Austin. <laughs> I had to wind around a little bit. But it was like just, you know, coming and enjoying this idea that there were a lot of trees, it was green, and it, it seemed really relaxed. And people knew how to do things like drink beer and have a good time. And that was one thing working on this book, kind of, you know, where does this come from? What's, what's the groove? What's the mojo? What's this cosmic other that separates this place from everywhere else. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to pin down, but I kept going back to the oldest business in Austin being Schultz Garden. Um, 1868, since 1868, a bunch of Germans got together so they could sing and make music and dance and drink beer. And, you know, that's just kind of, that's that defines my, Usually, early on, it was going to parties, and it was always an excess of everything. And then when I finally moved here, it was kind of like, uh, I sort of knew what I was getting into, but it was reading Chet Flippo and, and Rolling Stone and Cream and kind of glomming onto this, these stories about what's going on at the Armadillo and Soap Creek Saloon and uh, going to see Doug Somm at Soap Creek Saloon like a, a week or two after we had arrived. So what was that like seeing Doug Somm? It was like, it was everything that Chet described, but even more. And that never happens. I mean, usually writers bullshit you. You know, I mean, they had a great experience, but why am I not having the same experience? <laughs> uh, but no, it was great, and it was just, it was like it, it, it was like you were in this secret place. The armadillo was like everything writ large. It was one place you could be different in Texas, where hippies were had reached a critical mass where they had this music hall and, and kind of the culture predominated. It wasn't, you know, uh, hippies at a concert hall run by slick concert promoters. I mean, the, the promoters were the same as the audience, so it was very different. And so there's critical mass, but once you get the armadillo and hang out, and if you kind of want to go one step beyond, that was Soap Creek because it was hard to get to. You had to kind of know about it. Uh, even though it's in you know the heart of Westlake now, but it, it was just this cool roadhouse, and it was far enough off the road you could pretty much do whatever you wanted and not get caught or not get bothered. And I remember early on the night that 
all of a sudden, there's the county sheriff, Raymond Frank, and he's just hanging out, waving, and hanging out with the kids, and there's all kinds of sh shit going on. <laughs> and Raymond was uh, running as the sheriff that shoots straight, but at Soap Creek, he was, he was kind of known as the, the sheriff who shoots straights. Uh, Austin was different. And that, that became pretty evident very quickly, too. And, you know, I, what I loved about reading this book, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know you're writing pretty well, so I knew it was going to be a good book. But before I read it, I thought it was going to be one of those kind of chronological, maybe a, a slog through Austin's history from the beginning to the end. And this is so, so interesting, the way you conceived of this and put it together. Those of you who have read it or seen it, know that what Joe Nick has done is he's taken these kinds of key elements that made Austin Austin and is sort of I, I and these and that's what the chapters are and they're generally chronological but you go f you know you have a chapter on uh, the sort of the writers who came to Austin the the pickers who came to Austin the rise of say Whole Foods or Michael Dell and computer and you you find these kind of key people to tell the story of each chapter but then you have the rest of the context in there and it, and it works really well and I just want to ask you to talk about one of these kind of to begin and that is so that to tell the story of Austin's rise as a as a literary scene a place where writers congregate you begin with the image of this poet mowing a lawn can you talk about that <laughs> oh, well, I figures it's a poet mowing uh, his lawn because I'll make the point that the first big bang is Mirabeau Lamar, the second president of the Republic of Texas, declaring after he shoots a buffalo near present day 8th and Congress, rides up the hill with, to where the capital is and declares, this shall be the seat of empire, which is pretty ridiculous when you think about it because there was really no reason other than aesthetic beauty to found Austin as any kind of capital. It was on the frontier. And so fast forward. Uh, to the 1960s, and uh, it's mainly because I'd heard his stories working at Texas Monthly uh, when I joined the staff in 1985, hanging around at the magazine. You know, you learn so much through osmosis and assimilation, but uh, Stephen Harrigan's story is about mowing lawns uh, to support his writing habit early on when he came to Austin. And to me, it was beautiful because I love I loved to mow lawns. I I remember for years at Texas Monthly trying to pitch a cover story on lawns, and they give me these looks. But there's you know it's the it everything's got a zen. This is my zen, is if I'm pushing a lawn more or riding a lawn more, it's my thinking time. And for Steve to tell the story was like pretty ridiculous. But you know you drill down deeper, and and, and that that was kind of the motivation. Steve Harrigan is, is, is the quintessential Austin writer, and you could argue that, no, his best friend Larry Wright is the greater writer, but here are two of the greatest writers on earth, and they're, they're best friends, and they're in Austin, and they, they both touched on all these realms of literature, I mean, that, that, that go beyond books or magazine articles. I mean, to Larry writes his own plays, and... Steve has is, is written wonderful fiction as well as nonfiction and done all these things. So they tell so many good stories. But Stephen stumbles into Austin because he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's in Corpus. His older brother is going to St. Ed's. So he goes and visits St. Ed's, and he sees a skateboarder. And he says, that's, that's what set me off. I, I, I've never seen a skateboarder before, so I decided I'll go to St. Ed's. And... <laughs> Within a year, he discovers that, no, he, he changes to UT because he discovers the union showing films. And he said, I, this concept didn't register with me that I thought movies were shown in movie theaters. And here a university is showing movies, and they're showing movies that movie theaters don't show. So I wanted to go there. And so what did you do? And he said, well, I majored in poetry because there were no writing programs. And he, indeed, Steve, Steve Harrigan started to be a poet. He, he kind of says now, I don't really know why I was wanted to be a poet, but that they had a program there, and, and, and he started a pretty cool uh, poetry zine called Lucille, uh, which had some resonance in the 1970s. 
before I figured out that, you know, writing articles for magazines and how he stumbles into all this is so innocent to know who he is today and he's writing a thousand word history of, of, of Texas. A thousand page, yeah. A thousand page, uh, yeah, a thousand word, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, he's doing this epic uh, sweeping book and, and so uh, he was my guide through the liter literary chapter and that was an afterthought. I didn't think I was going to do literature. Uh, and it turned out that there was more of a lit literary community in Austin that I had perceived, and like music today, it's real, it's 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 big, it's macro, and it's really diverse. So there are all these smaller literary communities within this greater community, and it, it, to the extent it, you know, you don't see this in other cities. I mean, this is this is a handful of cities in the United States where you actually have writers congregating and living and bouncing off each other and uh, and, and sharing. So uh, that Stephen's just a wonderful guide and uh, it starts with lawn mowing. And I don't want to I don't want to give away the end of the chapter too much but you have this guy who is mowing yards t to make a living and he can afford to do that because living is cheap in Austin at the time and he can write in the afternoons and mow in the mornings but by the end of the chapter he's part of that great salon with Larry Wright and H.W. Brands. And, and Greg Curtis. And Greg Curtis. That yeah, I, I cite the, the coffee clatch they have. I haven't been before, and at one point I did, you know, yeah, you ought to come up sometime. You know, I, I, I live too far away to go have coffee in Austin right now. I live out in the boonies. But that's like the smartest table. It's at Swedish Hill at the very least, but probably the smartest table in Texas at that very moment. And whatever they're discussing, the, the the ways of the world is 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 some pretty deep stuff, and and that story about Steve is so emblematic of so many of the people who made Austin Austin because you have these people who are sort of drawn to the city almost instinctively, and they had these things inside of them that were just triggered kind of by living in Austin. Well, it's where they came from. Uh, in a lot of respects, y you you couldn't work out these ideas. Or, moreover, if, if you came from Texas, and this is historic and pre-1970, uh, uh, you were discouraged from having ideas, much less working them out where you came from. So you come to this, this safe place or free spot, uh, and you can, you know, you can let her rip because you see there's other people like me. Uh, you're, not, you're not alone anymore. And, and to me, it's... it's that was that was, that was forever in Austin uh, for someone from Texas, and that's what the university offered this kind of shelter. But what started happening in 1970? I mean, and if you lived in Austin, you 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 and you didn't have much aspiration. You were there to groove, and you know it was cheap and easy. You could slack. Uh, but if you had aspirations, you're supposed to go at, at the very least to Dallas or Houston, if not somewhere else, to seek your fortune. And that was the way it was for hippies in the 1960s even. You know, Janis Joplin, it wasn't just Janis Joplin, Pal St. John, but it was Travis Rivers who managed Mother Earth, who knew about music management. Uh, it was Chet Helms of the Family Dog who, who basically introduced poster art to San Francisco because uh, his uncle and his uh, daddy were holy roller preachers, so he knew about offset printing here in Texas. <laughs> And, and you had Gilbert Shelton providing the posters and, you know, creating underground comics that, like the Furry Freak Brothers. So all the, these were so, sort of aspirational hippies. You left. You went to where there was greener pastures, the big time. But what started happening in the early 70s, first with music, is a scene's happening that people have all these perceptions about, and it gets known, it gets heard about, and people start coming to be part of this scene. So the, the migration is reversed. And the migration that started in the, the 70s, that hadn't stopped. And I thought it stopped, you know, it stopped in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and, you know, how can they keep coming in the last five years? It hadn't stopped, but it starts with music. So the hippies are the foundation, then there's music, and then there's all these other layers that build upon it. And they're all, they, it's communities. By the end of the 70s, you know, what started with the armadillo and Willie and the 
and, and the rednecks and uh, whatever people perceived as a pro progressive country had grown into all these tribes. It was whatever your music tribe is. Oh, no, I'm not into that, you know, cowboy stuff. No, I'm, I'm into African music. Oh, you need to go see Dan Del Santo and his boys and start hanging out. No, I'm into ska music. And, uh, you know, it, no matter what your groove was, there was a community in Austin. So it became multicultural, musically speaking, to, to today. It's so diverse. There, I don't know what the sound is, but it's a lot of different sounds. And that's happened with all these other things, uh, in, including uh, 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 film and food, uh, and just all these, uh, the, the other disciplines I tried to recognize in the book. But they've all kind of blown up and become diffuse. Uh, and it's, different, it's a different game than it was, but I'm really attracted to, well, how, how did someone invent these out of nothing? And who are these people? And the stories are, you know, they're, they're beautiful stories especially when you do it for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Which sounds very organic because it's, it's, not a, it's not about making money so much as it is about finding yourself and finding a creative path forward. And, and for so many of these people, it became a sustainable path. And I think Richard Linklater is a great example of that. Jim Franklin's another. And you, and you tell these all, all throughout. And I, you know, one of the fascinating about things about your book is that normally when you read a history of a city, you hear about the politics, you know, the influence of politics or, you know, the, the university's influence even. And that, those things don't really happen here. Well, it's, it's, this is about alternative culture. And call it what you want. I mean, hippies are part of an, you know, they may be the inspiration to it, but there's also the beats that goes before then. But alternative culture has been kind of part of the woven into Austin's history. But what happened, again, in, in the 70s, when the migration reversed, when, you know, when Doug Thomas shows up from San Francisco and he's, he's planting his flag in Austin, it's like, well, why am I going to San Francisco? This guy here thinks it's cooler here and, and starts kind of changing minds. You know, that, that just, uh, that started changing the whole na nature of the beast. And I, th I think, uh, you know, people, people just started recognizing that this was a different place and place, they would come and sample it, and I, I'm, I kind of apologize. For, I would, a lot of times people from out of state would come, and I love showing around. And like, my California friends at the time couldn't believe you could drink in your car. <laughs> but, you, you know, uh, you had to be drunk to get a DWI. But you could drink. And so, you know, they, they would get their, uh, uh, their, their, their bottles. And I, I also remember uh, in 1980, one, yeah, it was 81, I think, uh, um, 81 or 82, when Los Lobos first came to Texas. I got to show them around Austin. They were opening up for the band I managed, Joe King Carrasco, and I'd met them in L.A., uh, told them to come to Texas, and here they were. And it was nice last year that uh, running into them, they remembered my old, I had a 59 Cadillac for a little while, and they remembered it really well, but just like, driving down Guadalupe and showing them what there was. And it's like these guys were slack-jawed. They thought, you know, what is, what is this candy land here? And I, I think that that's how it, it, it's appealed to some people. I mean, if you're outdoors-minded, it's, it's like for Lance Armstrong, beside moving to Colorado or California, this was the only place to go for a guy from Plano. Plus, he was still close enough so it could be close to his mom who was in Plano. And that's kind of our difference here is roots. We tend to, uh, uh, if you com compare and contrast Austin in the 70s versus San Francisco in the 60s, uh, I think there was more of a, a respect of where does this, this all come from? So instead of completely rebelling against your parents and grandparents, you know, why do they like this music so much? You know, it's really not bad music. It's got some redeeming values or, you know, it's discovering beer is okay as well as LSD, uh, that it just didn't have to be one trick, but there's been that respect. And so um, you recognize these things and it, it, for some of us, it speaks to us. This is a great place for some people. It's too damn humid and they got allergies all year round and they gotta go somewhere else or it's too much traffic, I don't know. 
and you know, it's it's kind of exhilarating reading reading the book and and reading the stories of these people and seeing. I'm going to come back to Link later because here's a guy who came in, as you say, who just really wanted to to watch movies, and then next thing you know, he's making films, and that happened to so many. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, th to me, that's again, that's doing things for all the wrong reasons. R Rick wanted to make films. He was very interested in. Uh, Serious enough that he worked offshore uh, and made a lot of money working offshore where he could buy himself a really fine camera and also make enough money so he could come to Austin and for two years do nothing but watch film. Ran out of place and watch film. And it was basically to take advantage of the university. But it's not by going to film school. He never went to a film class at all. He took advantage of what the university was showing, but he discovered with after in getting into the second year of film, uh, oh, they're t the professors are teaching the same films every year. Uh, you know, I, how many times do I need to watch Godard's Weekend? Uh, he wanted to go deeper than that, and he met uh, this guy at a Super 8 film club uh, named Lee Daniel, and Lee was the same way. And they said, let's start this club so we can we can watch more movies and you know things that the university's not bringing and that's the basis of the austin film society which if you see the film society today which has its own theater which has its own producer class uh, which gives out hundreds of thousands of grants to independent uh, directors every year really has fostered independent film and documentary film in in austin uh, that started by this idea, let's, let's watch more movies. Like Eddie Wilson, hey, let's start a concert hall so my band can have a place to play. Shiva's head band can have a, a place to play. Uh, and it just keeps going through that. I mean, I saw the bats up here earlier, and the, the reason uh, Merlin Tuttle moved to Austin is he was a bad expert. He read the headlines that they were, you know, they were trying to poison all the bats that they discovered in the new you know, reconfigured Congress Avenue Bridge. They were ex trying to exterminate him because they gave you rabies. So he just moved down here because this was an opportunity. There's a lot of bats down here, and I know all about bats, and I'm going to turn people's head around. So this one guy makes this move, and how many thousands of people every night from March till November are gathered at the Congress Avenue Bridge to see this tourist attraction that people – City leaders were ready to exterminate this attraction not, not even 25 years ago. So it, it's people like that all the way through, and uh, they're, they're origin stories. Uh, but they made something out of nothing, and it somehow not only stuck, but it resonated to define Austin to the world or stick out that was that make, makes Austin unique. That's yeah. that's what I was looking. And I want to get to questions in just a moment, but let me let me ask you one other thing too. In that kind of same regard, and that's South by Southwest, which you point out is really the prime mover of innovation and technology far more than the university is really. Well, as far as uh, what South by Southwest has become, it's not just it's technology, it's film, it remains music, and anything that's rolled out to those consumer groups is rolled out now in Austin in March. I mean, it's, it's uh, the film festival is, it's, it's not Sundance, but it's only second to Sundance. And it's, in fact, for things like music documentaries, there's not a better, uh, better known festival in the United States. Uh, and, and, you know, new bands uh, roll out their, uh, uh, their product, but more importantly, technology has become the, the engine and if anything is new, uh, and I cite uh, Twitter in 2007 being rolled out and the fact that the first Airbnb was, uh, was rented by the CEO of Airbnb in Austin. I mean, there were all these firsts. It, it's all being tested here. And even if one has a pass and access and can make it through all the, the, the density and craziness, uh, it's kind of like I don't hear – if you try to stay on top of it, good, good luck. But you're going to hear about it six months to a year later. But it's going to be rolled out at South by Southwest. And this is basically uh, an idea that was how to, how to independent bands from Austin 
get their foot in the doors with record labels in New York and Los Angeles. That was the, mate, the question that motivated uh, the directors uh, to start South by Southwest. And it's the same people that started it that are still running it. That's, that, that's, this is kind of off the charts. It's they, they haven't sold out to someone else. Uh, they still control it. Uh, and it's, you know, whatever the vision is, it's still the, the original folks, whatever you think of it. But it's, it's the biggest thing of its kind uh, anywhere as far as a convention or gathering. And it's the, you know, number one tenant for the Austin Convention Center. This is how culture, culture informs the economy in Austin. And you tell me another city of this size uh, where culture drives the economy. I can't, I've, I've really tried to think about these things, but it's this culture that rose up, this alternative culture that's become mainstream, it's mainstreamed. Uh, to the point that if you're alternative, you may think it's gotten too mainstream. But this is, this is really unique, how, how this culture, the live music capital of the world, keep Austin weird, drives the economy. And technology is the big driver, but technology wouldn't ha have happened in the form that it is. And it's not just Samsung or Dell. It's all these software companies. It's all these game designers. It's really kind of more the indies on a street level, just like the music is still very indie oriented and film is very indie and outsider oriented. They define the culture. And there's not many places like of this size and certainly of this dynamic where the culture is driving the economy like it is at the same time where the economy is fixing or threatening to drive out the culture by lack of affordability and chasing the artist out of its core, which are, this, this is what I've struggled with towards the end. And I'm still ambivalent about it, but uh, it's still here. That's what I was looking for. Is it still here amidst all this, uh, all the groove tax that's being imposed on us? Okay, well, let's, let's continue the conversation. We'd love to have your questions for Joe Nick about this book and about Austin. I have a microphone here if anybody has a question. Who wants to start? All right, no question. So we'll just quit. <laughs> Who would, here we go. I don't have any microphone. I have a theory about Aquafest being subsumed by South by Southwest as an evolutionary uh, municipal function. That, that's actually, that's a really good question because that, that, th they're almost opposites in that, well, they're not. Aquafest was started and it was a riff off of the Aquatennial in Minneapolis, which is a summer celebration. And Aquafest started, what was it, 60s or 50s, but it was it, to give people something to do in August because it was the dead of summer and there was nothing for people to do. But it was also, it was for the, the so-called gentry of Austin, which is almost an oxymoron. Uh, uh, and I try to make that point, and, which is one reason why alternative culture drives Austin. But South by Southwest was founded basically and determined to be in March for the same reasons, because it was spring break and traditionally the students went to the mountains or to the coast and Austin emptied out and the clubs that were open uh, tended to close down during spring break. So wouldn't it be nice if we could do something that would keep some of these clubs busy? It was, th these are simple ideas. So that was like why it was determined to be uh, in March. And now it's to the point, you know, it's become a, its own spring break. People, the kids don't want to go to the coast. They don't want to go to the mountains. They want to come and party and act like fools during South by Southwest in Austin. So it, it's it, irony heaped upon irony. But, and, and I'll say this, and I tried to bring out festival itis. I don't think there's any dead weekends left anymore, dead weeks. Uh, there's something going on all the time now. And so, you know, it's great if you're a looky-loo, you can come into town and there's something happening for you. But, uh, you know, I kind of miss those slow periods a little bit, just a little. Looky-loo. Looky-loos. 
That was a, uh, Liz Lambert was talking to me about the evolution of South Congress, which I'd written about in the early 2000s for Preservation Magazine about the bottom up uh, preservation uh, and restoration of South Congress, basically looking at people like Steve Wertheimer and Liz Lambert. And they were, uh, you know, very informative. Liz, uh, we were t I, I was talking about her, with her, for this book. And so some years had passed since the early 2000s and things had grown. And she was saying, well, you know, it's now mostly looky-loos here on South Congress. It's gone from independent startup businesses. Uh, some of those early independents have now moved off to cheaper rent, uh, to Fort View Road or, or other places. So South Congress has now evolved into what's really fueling it are what the art critic Dave Hickey in his book Air Guitar calls looky-loos. And they come into a scene, they'll take their pictures or spend their money uh, and, and they'll check it out, but they won't really contribute anything to that scene other than that. So there's got to be a scene there for them basically to keep going. And that's this point of, of maturation of South Congress, and now it's getting pricey and upscale, is kind of like the looky-loos are fueling that. The hipsters that dreamed up Lucy in, dis in disguise and, and all, the, all these great uh, stores and just offbeat places, um, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard for a St Steve Wertheimer to walk in there now and do what he's done over the years. So it's just, it's, it's evolved and it's matured. And, and that happens to all the scenes. I've, I'm, I really have a lot of ambiguity about East Austin and the fact that, oh, it's changed and you know, we've, we've chased out, you know, the black, black population, the brown population has been gentrified out. And part of me, the irony on that is that that, that was only the designated black and brown part of Austin through segregation laws in 1929. That, you know, it used to be Mexican Americans, African Americans lived scattered around in different parts of town, still had to suffer under segregation. But I always wondered why this line, I lived in East Austin in Swede Hill in the 1970s, which is like a couple blocks in on East 16th. And I always wondered, you know, there were Swedes here once upon a time. There were no ethnic neighborhoods left in Austin by the 70s, only the, the leftover of these designated areas. So I don't like the fact that you lose the heritage of the neighborhood, that people sell out and they move. Now they have to move into suburbs. So African-American population actually declined in Austin. And a lot of the Mexican-American population is now in the suburbs south of Austin. So you, do you still have soul in East Austin if you chased away the people that made it soulful? I don't know. On the other hand, there are places that never I never dreamed would exist in East Austin that I have frequented. There are restaurants I've dined at that have kind of blown my mind. Uh, I love the urban farming mu movement, which only popped up in the 1990s. So every, every neighborhood involves. And, and my lesson was years ago looking at uh, the Upper West Side of New York where there's all these 20, 30-story high-rises, brick buildings that were mainly built in the mid-20th mid century. And then one block, all of a sudden on a corner, there's a brownstone. And you go, what's this doing here? But you start sitting there figuring, figuring long enough, oh, this whole neighborhood once upon a time was nothing but brownstones. And here's this left. And so that's the broken spoke for me. As a broken spoke, if you've seen it long enough, God, it's, it's the last one left. But again, perspective, if you just got to Austin this week, and let me tell you, go down South, South Lamar, and you'll be looking at all these cool places, condos and stuff, right in the middle of it, a real genuine honky-tonk. Dig it. So it's all about your perspective. If you just got here, you probably think it's pretty cool. If you've been here a while, maybe it's not as cool as it once was, but you're still here, so it must be cool enough for you. How do you feel about the future? Is the spirit is here yet right now, or why is it? What's the, you know, you're optimistic, but what's the best thing? 
Uh, I'm on the cusp about the future. So can you repeat the question so we can pick it up for you? How, how, do, how do I feel about the future? Uh, it's more that th I think in the next 20 years, uh, it's good that, you know, the affordability issue and how, how can a musician afford to be a musician or any creative be afford to be a creative? The fact that it's, the problem's recognized, that's terribly important. Now, in the next 20 years, can someone come up with practical solutions that address these issues and, and create some balance without it just being, uh, you know, regulated to death? That's the other thing I worry about. It's, it was always loose and free of regulations, but now it's like you've got you've to have this infrastructure to help people out, and, I, you know, that comes with its own baggage sometimes. Next 20 years, when I'm too old to do anything about it. You know, since we're in San Marcos, can you talk about the connection between San Marcos and Austin? Uh, what you see there? Well, I've always looked. Look, this, this is this, the metro area of Austin infects immediate places around it. It's not a a blueberry and a pea soup. It's <laughs> it's an island in a, a hostile Red Sea, and the island is gaining in land mass. So maybe it's a volcanic island, uh, and. San Marcos has always struck me since the early 70s when I started hanging out here. I mean, I had my Aquarina experience as a kid and was always, my mind was blown by that water. And just seeing that water probably put a lot of ideas in my head to explain my love of writing about water and wanting to be around water. Uh, but San Marcos always struck me as Austin 20 years ago, and it still does. And it's a compliment. I know. Some San Martians have taken umbrage that I, I, refute, uh, I, I referred to it as Austin Jr. But I really do look at it, and it, it's, it's got a lot of the qualities, in fact, more of them as far as natural beauty with springs than, than Austin does. And it, those, the natural beauty in the place reflect this as much as, it, as a Barton Springs reflects Austin in many ways, in fact, more so. And it just reminds me that in the 70s and early 80s, you know, the old reputation of, of sweatsuit was, well, this is where you come to really party. I mean, if Austin's like a little too academic for you and you really want to roar, this is where you come. Uh, so I think that maybe it's that place. It's a little, it's hard to be aspirational here. Maybe that's changing now. Uh, there's more infrastructure to be aspirational. But I keep thinking there's, you know, when you've got the river right there, you know, can't you take an hour out of your busy life and just jump into that water and splash around and work? I mean, it's, that's like dying and going to heaven. And there's no water like this. I've, it's twice I, I have, uh, I've had to petition, but I've gotten to s swim legally in Spring Lake, uh, both times followed by one of those glass bottom boats. But just to be able to swim in, I keep telling the people in charge, man, y'all let the public swim in here all the time. We'd all start fighting for your place. But I, I'm just content to swim illegally there, but okay. <laughs> so, other questions, uh, comments about Austin? Yes? Uh, we don't know it, but it's, uh, the dialectic is always at work. Um, Austin City Limits, the original premise is to export indigenous music. Later on, it morphs into importing music. Um, South by Southwest, the original mission was to export indigenous music and to connect it to the outside world. Later on, it becomes a mecca to attract music from all over around. So there's always something that changes the thing which is into something which isn't. So, following up on the same question, from an anthropological point of view, are you an historian or a futurist? <laughs> uh, a futurist would be a better gig, but I don't think I'm qualified, and I'm a terrible prognosticator. So I'm 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 very uh, I'm very careful in in that respect. I'd like to say that I'm the futurist, but I do feel so much like an anthropologist in what I do, and it's like I like zooming back, and you know. I, I, I walk into en enough strange scenes that I'm comfortable being a stranger in those scenes 
and trying to make something out of those scenes and explain them, interpret and translate. And boy, that's a great point because it started with indigenous, all these indigenous things, and it grew to the point that now it's absorbing outside trends and then make, making that, I guess, part of the indigenous culture. Uh, all these different sounds that have been integrated, all the different styles of filmmaking. I mean, you could say originally, yeah, it was like the, uh, the success of, of Linkletter, uh, Judge, and Rodriguez established it, but you look what's being done now, and it's so all over the map. Keith Maitland's work blows my mind. I mean, he's, he's mess, messed with rotoscope, and he's done serious subjects. So that's like a couple generations removed from these original guys. But what's interesting, and, and this is my argument again when I look at the music, the, the psychedelic music coming out of San Francisco, indigenous in the 60s, didn't necessarily play out all right. It, it, I cite Journey and Huey Lewis. And you can make exceptions what you say, but with, but the, what started in Austin in the 70s, there's still a, a thread of that. And call it Texas country, singer, songwriter. Uh, that kind of indigenous music persists, as do the indigenous uh, uh, blues, rhythm and blues, country western. I mean, and hardcore, these are all roots-oriented sounds as well as Cajun and Zydeco and Conjunto, all these in indigenous sounds are recognized and in fact are in many respects are healthier than they were 50 years ago. So I don't know, I I'd love to predict, but I'm pretty shitty at that. <laughs> what do you think about our, our old friend uh, Don Hyde who claims that the spark that set the gasoline off originally And I took time in my, uh, in writing, in fact, that was kind of one of my later pieces, is I bought into Don Hyde's theory, which was, it was mescaline that defined, and peyote that defined Austin, and kind of, <laughs> it divides it from everywhere else. That San Francisco was an LSD town, and, and what finally synthesizing uh, uh, peyote into mescaline, or, or, or figuring out the chemical, and trading it with San Francisco, that's what brought in LSD to Austin finally. But it was it was really this peyote and people were doing it. It was legal in the 60s and it was uh, Hudson's Cactus Garden and, and Tasker Hudson selling what he knowingly called dope cactus. Not only just to people for decorative purposes, but to intellectuals in Paris, to academics on both coasts uh, and to a handful of knowledgeable people from the ghetto and I just it was being with you Bob one night at uh, the not dead yet party I think it was but hearing these stories about boiling peyote in these safe houses in in Lockhart and Driftwood uh, trying to figure out peyote is terrible taste it makes you throw up the one time I did it it makes you throw up but it's the most colorful vomit I've ever seen <laughs> uh, so I understand so all these people were trying to boil it down and figure a more palatable way to ingest it. And this, as I heard this story in Lockhart, uh, there was a group of people, including Jim Franklin was there, and a woman who freaked out or for some reason spontaneously ran naked down the road and attracted the attention of the, uh, one of the deputy sheriffs in Caldwell County who came to investigate and seeing all these hippies in this big vat of stuff what's going on here and Jim Franklin calmly explains we're trying to derive plant-based paint <laughs> so I can f complete this painting here <laughs> from this boiling these boiling plants and to which the sheriff nodded and let him go along his way <laughs> but uh, I just love that period because if anyone with experience who's experienced mescaline is very different than LSD and it's more like it's it's almost benign and uh, and mild, but generally happy inducing, I guess. And to hear these stories that oh yeah, it came out of here, and uh, we took it to San Francisco, and man, we immediately traded. And 
and then uh, bringing LSD to Austin. That was a big deal. But Don, I also saw it as the last guy to leave Austin to get run out. And he finally left in 1970 with a threat from a member of the Vice Squad who lived across the street from him. I don't know what charge we're going to bring up, but we will bring a charge. You've got 24 hours to leave town. So he was the last one in that out migration as far as I try to tell the story. And shortly after he's leaving, or about the same time, here comes people like Willie Nelson and Michael Murphy and Jerry Jeff Walker, Doug Salm, and all these, these musicians start conglomerating here, and things started to change. All right. Uh, we'll do one more question. Yes. I can't wait to read your book. Um, one of the things I've noticed in Austin, uh, and I don't know any statistics on it, is it seems like there's a lot more children there, um, like K through 12 age, uh, than there used to be. Uh, maybe it's just because I spend more time with them, but it does seem like, I notice one of the things I really love is a lot of the bars slash restaurants that have great bars and playgrounds. Um, and so I was wondering if you've seen any with education with children, any innovation or just kind of figure out something fun and crazy to do about that uh, K through 12 education area? You know, it, it, it probably reflects more my limited knowledge of education than anything, but what I was trying to tease out with all these stories is something that resonated nationally and someone had asked early along the way, what about GSD and M? And I said, well, they're an advertising company. Well, they do really good ads. Yeah, but do they, does someone change the game? And I haven't seen it yet. Uh, the closest I come to in this book is, is Citing Community First, which is a, a, a tiny home community for the homeless in, in Austin uh, on Springdale. And those folks to me are coming up with solutions no one's done that anywhere on this kind of scale in, in at least this part of the country. So that's what I was trying to tease out. But, you know, there's a lot of in innovative education going on and more and more, I think, uh, less conventional. I mean, I, I'm wanted, I was raised in public schools in Texas, and I just can't assume that you get that education anymore. And I start realizing I was pretty lucky that I wasn't a square peg in a round hole, but a lot of people don't fit into modern mass education. It's like, I do think Austin's one of these places that kids with that learn differently or uh, don't fit into that square peg, they can come and get an education. But that, that's been, that's almost baked into, thanks to the university, that's always been encouraged. And I, cer certainly not discouraged. Well, thank you, Joe Nick. Thank you all. Joe Nick's going to sign books over right around the corner. Thanks again for coming out. <laughs>